We are inside black and gold wrapping up voluntary workouts this week, folks. We're getting into mandatory mini camp next week. And uh, the heat was on again uh, for our practice session, something that I know you're definitely going to be looking forward to for those Irvine, California training camp practices. Yeah, it's been weird. It's been raining all week. Like it's it's rained all day today. It's been flooding. But for whatever reason, whenever we go out to the Saints practices, it's like not a cloud in the sky. <laughs> like not at all. Four degrees. Um, but hey, you know, at, at least we got to see a bunch of outdoor practices. And so, yeah, this is going to be the last OTA session we talk about. We still don't have times for the uh, mini camp practices. I'm sure that'll be coming out shortly, probably by the time we post this podcast. But we've got a good bit to talk about this first segment. I want to get you kind of recap notes, whatever, from this final set of practices. We're going to talk a little bit about Spencer Rattler because I went in on him in the last episode. So I want to kind of put a bow on that. A uh, couple player, one one rookie came back in Jalen Ford. We'll talk about that. Chris Olave had a big day. I've been calling him Red Olave, kind of like Red Hulk. You know, if you know anything about uh, superhero movies, like Red Hulk is like super strong because uh, he had a big day in the red jersey. I don't know if it's maybe because the defense couldn't touch him. Uh, hands off. Yeah, I think I think that was probably part of it. Uh, but anyway, we're going to talk about that and a couple other things from practice. Second segment, got an interview with Marcus Robertson, Saints secondary coach. Had some interesting things to say about Kool-Aid, about Marshawn, about forcing turnovers, that sort of thing. So we'll listen to that. Also got an update on Chase Young. So a couple health updates in the second segment along with that interview. Final segment, I want to talk about the stock up players. I typically would say stock up, stock down, but I don't think it's fair to to say, okay, this player's stock is down after a couple OTA practices, right? Like, I think that's too harsh at this point. We'll have a better idea after minicamp when we watch three days of practice in a row. So right now, I just want to talk about the stock up players. What players took advantage of these practices to put themselves in a better position going forward? And then maybe a couple players who missed opportunities is, is how I'll phrase it. Because there was a couple players, particularly particularly one, that I thought had a had a really rough day and definitely changed some opinions uh, of of what they might be looking at going into the season. But first things first, Steve, what were your takeaways? How did you feel about this day of practice? I'm also going to flash up a uh, kind of highlights package. I put the term highlights in uh, in quotes because what do highlights mean to you because this is just a couple <laughs> people running around throwing passes, but I will play them. So Steve, what were your thoughts on the day? How did you think uh, the final set of OTAs went for everyone involved? I definitely thought uh, a heavy emphasis on special teams, uh, for sure. That's, that seemed like a pretty lengthy period uh, focused on that. And, man, I guess, you know, we're getting ready, obviously, for these new rule changes. Darren Rizzi was at the forefront of those changes, and it just seems uh, the team has really been focusing on everything from punt and kick uh, in these sessions. I thought that was pretty hefty yesterday. Uh, you mentioned uh, talking about Spencer Rattler having a, a bounce back day, I guess you could say, after struggling in the, the OTA sessions we saw. It was, it was great not to see him throw an interception, obviously, uh, in this in this practice uh, workout. Uh, we've talked about it before, how obviously we're just limited in, in the practices we do get to see. So, uh, he might have been as proficient in other sessions. We just don't know about it. And then uh, for me, just uh, kind of curious about this secondary right now. You got uh, two of your main guys out in a Marshawn Lattimore and a Pulse and a Debo. Uh, great for Elante Taylor getting more work right now. Also, a guy like Kool-Aid McKinstry still on the sidelines, not doing much as he recovers from an injury. So that that's a big question right now on how things are going to look. We'll see what happens come mandatory minicamp next week, uh, attendance-wise there. But uh, like I said, a lot of questions for me with the secondary, and I, I think we talked about it. It was either on the show, the Sports Talk program last week, or on the podcast. Just a big question mark for me still remains. Obviously, we talk about the the, the offensive line, but who is going to be that other safety alongside Tyron Matthew, who was also absent yesterday for fa for family reasons? Yeah, I still think it's Jonathan Abram, but that's something we can we'll, we'll get a better picture of. Right, Jordan uh, Howden is a guy that I think will work his way in. But either way, I do want to get back to so the special teams work. I do think that one of the reasons we saw a lot more special teams work in this practice is probably because 
that's just their schedule for the week. We were out there on Wednesday instead of Tuesday. And I would guess that Wednesday they spend time on kickoffs. Tuesday they spend time on punt coverage. Or Thursday they spend more time on punt coverage, that sort of thing. Or we might guess. I think we'll get a better idea next week as to how that's all kind of shaken out. But I don't think it was like, oh, today they're working on special teams, whereas they haven't previously. I think yeah. that's how Wednesdays go. Um, either way, I do want to get into Spencer Rattler. And, you know, I don't want to talk about it forever. I don't want to talk about Spencer Rattler after every single practice. But I did kind of go in on Spencer in the last episode. So I want to just kind of update what what I saw. And, you know, the question I had was, can Spencer just put together a good quality day from start to finish that you can build on, right? I think what I said was you can't ha- you can't stack good days until you have a good day. And I think that's what we got, right? Now, it was limited. And I think that was probably by design because he went out in sevens. He had three reps. Nathan Peterman took one of his reps and he took one of his reps. It's kind of funny. Nathan Peterman, we haven't seen him in team drills at all. Until first that throw. Play. First throw we saw was an interception to Rico Payton. It was a nice play by Rico Payton, but it was also just looked like a miscommunication. And uh, I can't remember who he was targeting. It might have been Cedric Wilson, but it was not a not, a, not an auspicious way to to gain, uh, gain ground there. Spoiler, he's going to be one of the missed opportunity guys because he got one up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, the second one he took was a, was a check down, but uh, Spencer. Yeah. So he, he had three reps in seven on sevens, four reps in 11, but he only threw one pass in 11s. He didn't get into the third set of 11s because there was only time for two. And those went to Derek Carr and, and Jay Kaner. And, but those first seven on seven reps, you know, one of the reasons that I say this all the time, The stats out of camp drive me crazy, like how people try to use the stats out of camp. Like I have no problem with people keeping stats. And I think over time, it kind of gives you an aggregate look of how effective you've been running things. It's like, oh, how many interceptions have you actually thrown? But like the idea that you can really gain some, some true knowledge about how a guy played from like two out of three in this, in this set of drills, You, you really can't. You know, because there's so much variation in what that two out of three meant. You're not keeping yardage. You're not. It's it's tough. And in the case of Spencer, that one incompletion was his best day, in my opinion. Right. He he sat back there. It was a whole shot to Kyle Sheets. Right. Kyle was working over. He, you know, a whole shot is when you kind of there's, there's more to it than I'm going to explain it right here. But basically, you're talking about cover two shell. You're just hitting the gap in between the corner who's who's underneath and the safety who's over the top. It's a tough throw to make, especially when you go into the edge of the field, because you got to be perfect. You got to have the arm to get it there. You got to get it deep enough that it's not going to get played underneath by the corner. And you got to, you know, play it underneath the safety, which is a tough throw to make. If you don't get it there in time, your receiver gets blown up. If you, or the ball gets a play gets made on the ball, knocks it up in the air. That wasn't the case. It was a straight drop. It was a great throw to the point that, you know, and this was something I I saw that I appreciated. Derek Carr was watching and he, you know, he saw the drop and he made a point to just yell great ball and give him, give Spencer a high five. Cause I think that's one of those moments for a young player where it's like, that's got to be frustrating because you made a great throw. And it's right, just, what else do I have to do? <laughs> right. And and you're throwing to a UDFA. You're not throwing to Chris Olave, who catches that 10 times out of 10. So, you know, I do think that kind of affirmation of like, no, I'm not imagining that. I made a great throw uh, is, is nice to see. And, and that's the type of thing we hadn't seen, right? We, we'd seen some late deliveries, some, some balls off the hands that, you know, probably just weren't on target, probably were a little late. The defense was there to make a play. That's not the case. You know, there was one throw in the flat that was probably a little too far and outside to Kendra Miller, but Kendra made the catch. So no harm, no foul. It was the right read. Um, his only throw in 11s was the first rep. It was a play action, a hard play action boot where he came around and found Cedric Wilson deep downfield for a touchdown. It was a nice throw. It was a nice play. He handed off the next three reps. So I don't know if maybe the coaching staff was like, all right, we got it. We got it. Let's lend that pause. on a high note for him. Yes, exactly. It's like the George Costanza. It's like, I'm going to leave all on my head. I'm going to leave on a high note, right? Um, I felt kind of like that was what was going on, but I'm okay with that. Again, my goal for Spencer, I don't need him to go out and blow me away every snap, right? I don't need him to go out and be this superstar player in year one. I need him to progress. And I thought that's what he did yesterday. And so, like I said, I went into it with the question of, can he put a solid day together to have something to build on next week? and down the road in training camp. I thought he did that. And so that's what I was happy with for Spencer. 
I still think Jake's ahead of him. I'm not saying that there's a that changed a ton in the in the grand scheme of like who I'm looking at as the backup quarterback right now. But this is what I needed to see from Spencer, and and he got it. So I'm happy about that. Yeah, I totally agree. There, you, you're not expecting you know things to change miraculously overnight, but definitely good to see him this week, this time around that we got to view the practice. Those high throws weren't apparent. Uh, he was on target a lot more. And yeah, I mean, it's going to be a, a, a total growing process with him that you you just want to see those baby steps when we do get to view the practice sessions. Agreed. Now, going on to another topic, Jalen Ford got back on the field. That's the only injury update I'll give you here. I'm going to talk a little bit more about a couple other injury updates in the second segment uh, with Kool-Aid and, and Chase Young. But it was good to see Jalen out there, fifth round pick, another rookie. You know, we're talking about two fifth round picks here to start the show off. And, uh, it, you know, I think you're you're in a situation where, OK, he's getting in that kind of on field work with trainers this week. So hopefully next week he can get more involved in in some of the individual and maybe even team drills. But good to see him out there. Um, just a guy that you're going to want to see in that mix. Um, moving on, you know, Red Hulk, Chris Olave, like we talked about, uh, if you're a Marvel fan. Um, Red Hulk, super strong. And uh, Chris Olave, he put on that red jersey for team drills and man no one could touch him literally we'll put that red jersey on under his game day jersey to see if that works i don't know looked like tom brady running around out there uh, <laughs> red 12 uh, but um <laughs> no he had a really good day i do want to put a caveat on that in you know he beat alante taylor deep downfield there has to be a level of difficulty involved for a cornerback who knows if i bump this guy by accident i'm gonna get screamed at yeah. like that's going to be a doing, problem right? for me. So I do think that it is a bit of an unfair advantage to look at the wide receiver and say, oh, he beat that guy when that guy's not not even allowed to brush him, right? This isn't like a quarterback. Like, you're not tackling him. Like, that's different. When you're talking about covering a guy downfield, even in a non-contact practice, you're allowed a little bit, and they weren't. So I do want to say, put an asterisk on Chris Olave had a really good day because he was wearing that red jersey, and that's a little unfair. That said, Chris Olave had a really good day, and I'm really excited for what Chris Olave is going to be able to do this year. He said he put on some weight, you know, and I think that's been a process, and it was always going to be a process for Chris. Even though he came into his first training camp saying, I feel comfortable at the weight I'm at, each of these last two years, he's spent time kind of putting on a little bit of extra bulk, and I think that helped him last year. I think it's only going to help him more this year. The red jersey was a product of that because he was working probably a little too hard in the weight room, he he did something to his shoulder. I don't think we need to worry too much about like, oh, is it significant? If it was significant, they would have held him out of practice, right? The fact that you just put in a red jersey on him and sent him out there is pretty telling that it's not something they're concerned about long term. Uh, but he needs to be careful with, you know, high, couldn't do too much weight. Um, either no, way. I, I do appreciate, too, we're quick to criticize the folks that aren't around for these voluntary workouts. Olave didn't have to be out there after tweaking that shoulder in the weight room. So props to him for at least showing up to practice. He's putting in the work. He's putting in the work. Yeah. And, you know, he talked a lot about kind of his mental approach to, to, to not great games, right? Like it's really easy to look at a guy and say, oh, he's handling success so well. What happens when things don't go your way? What happens when you have a rough game where maybe you and the quarterback aren't on the same page where, you know, you you have a ball bounce off your face mask. Remember when he had the ball bounce off his face mask and he's wearing the shiesty? <laughs> And it was like, what the hell's going on? Like that, <laughs> that in Indianapolis. Uh, like those are the type of things that, you know, it's like it's easy to when everything's going well. What about when it's not? How do you how do you act when that's the case? And I think that's what he spent a lot of time this offseason really thinking about, really focusing on. And, you know, we talked last episode night. I had someone, uh, I think uh, Mitch uh, in the comments, I can't remember his last name, Milano, maybe, either way. He was like telling me that I'm crazy because I said that Chris Olave is closer to 20 than he is to 10 right now in terms of wide receiver rankings. Okay, yeah. And I say that in part just because statistically that's where he is. I would say he's in the range of 17th, 18th. I think he was 17th in yards and 16th in catches. So that's right there. You know, you're talking about from an impact perspective, that's where he is. But I say that full well believing that from a talent perspective, he has the ability, he's on a trajectory to be in that top 10 conversation this year if he's able to stay on the field and progress and build that connection with Derek, who by all accounts looks like he is ready to spam Chris Olave with targets this year. And so you could see him catch a hundred passes, go for 1500 yards. Touchdowns are a little tougher 
because uh, you know the way the Saints succeeded last year was by running the ball in from the one. So you're not gonna you're not gonna get a ton of touchdowns. But I want to see more yak. I want to see more just consistent involvement throughout the course of the season. I don't want to see that all kind of racked up in five or six games. I want to see you know his his floor game being something like six catches, seventy yards because it should be. It's probably the minimum. When teams are trying to take you away, that might change. But I have really high hopes for Chris Olave. I just think, realistically speaking, what he's done over his first two years has been really good. But we're not talking top 10 really good. We're talking, you know, solid. Right. I, I, I'm right there with you. Not top 10 yet, but the arrow on this guy, wherever you want to slot him in that, like you said, around 17, 18 uh, range. I mean, the arrow's going up on him. And I know a lot of people are blowing up and really stroking Garrett Wilson going into this year, you know, working with Aaron Rodgers, obviously with the Jets. But I, I would very much think there are two, two, run, or two wide receivers that are r- really on par with one another. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, no, I'm, 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 a, I'm a fan of Chris. I am. I'm a fan of, uh, you know, I, I hope that he can kind of embrace kind of that star turn because, you know, he, he was asked about that. Like, at what point did yeah. – you see defenses start to key on you. And it was like kind of last year, right? Like, cause year one, he was a rookie. You were going into the season with Marshawn. I'm sorry, with uh, Mike T and Jarvis, obviously they got hurt, but you know, it wasn't really until last year that, that he saw kind of defenses plan for him, right? Cause there's a point that you're a really solid receiver, but then you get to this stage where the other team is going in with a plan specifically for you. Right. Mike, Mike knows all about that, right? Mike, Mike got to that point um, very quickly with the Saints. And I think that's kind of where Chris is going to be now. So he's going to have to adjust to that. But that said, um, I'm excited. I'm excited for Chris. I'm excited for what he can do in this new offense. I'm sorry, I was going to say the biggest question with Olave that I've been hearing from a lot of folks is, the, is he a true number one wide receiver that needs to be answered? And – I, I'm not sure on that yet. If I consider him a true number one, or is he, you know, a great secondary number two option? Yeah, I mean, it's it's it, to me the question is: Is he an X? Yeah, uh, from a from a production standpoint, yes, he's going to be your top wide receiver. I just don't know if he's your traditional X because I just don't know if he can. You know, you're, you're, he's not a guy you're going to put out on an island and say battle man to man coverage every snap. So you're going to want to move him around. And but that's that's you know the NFL is like changing every year, so it's not like that's what it needs to be um moving forward isaiah foskey we got a chance to talk to isaiah yesterday um and i thought it was interesting because dennis allen's kind of assessment of isaiah this offseason has been very short and very simple he's like i want him to cut it loose i want him to stop thinking and want him to cut it loose and you always wonder it's like okay when a coach is that matter of fact in his analysis about a player what does the player think because the player's going to hear it like a lot, there's a lot of times like understand that when you're listening to the head coach talk, a lot of times he's talking to the media in front of him, but realistically the message is not for them. It is for the player. And I think that's what that is. It's like, no, Isaiah needs to hear this. And sure. He's probably saying that to him too, but like, that's what it's, it's not like I really want the media to report this. It's like, I need the player to understand that like, this is everyone knows this, like this is reinforcing it. And, you know, he was asked about it. And uh, here's a here's a quick clip from uh, from Isaiah yesterday. Got the whole playbook one year under my belt. It's pretty much all the same plays. I feel like the biggest thing from last year, this year, confidence, getting a lot stronger, being more explosive and just trusting what I can do. How big do you see like this year for you? Personally, like, you know, you think of a second year player, there's still time to figure it out, but it's also, you know, the NFL. And For me, I see it as like a big jump from year one to year two. I know a lot of people say that, but I feel like this year for me is going to be the biggest jump that you guys will see and I was just seeing myself. And yeah, you know, I think for Isaiah, he, he's, he, you know, one thing that's funny that I didn't even realize until just now is the Saints have made the number 41 pick in each of the last two drafts because he was also the number 41 pick and they traded up for, uh, Kool-Aid McKinstry at number 41. So they have two 41s back to back. But no, I think he's just a piece of this defense that a lot of people have kind of are sleeping on. I did think that he was coming along as the season went last year and the injury came at a really unfortunate time. Uh, It was the opening kickoff against the Bears. He just pulled his quad or uh, I think it was his quad and he just never got back, right? Like he tried to come back in the game against the Lions, re-aggravated it. He actually played in week 18, which... I didn't realize until today, and that's kind of telling of you know just 
he just wasn't having much of an impact. And a lot of it, he said, was just confidence. It was, you know, he was overthinking it. There was a lot going on. He had never really been hurt in his football career until that point. And that's difficult. Like he's trying to figure out how to make an impact in limited reps for the first time in a long time, maybe ever, right? When's the last time Isaiah Foskey wasn't, you know, a, a primary player on his team, right? That's just something that rookies in the NFL always have to figure out. And he didn't handle it well. And he'll, he'll admit that. That said, I do think that, you know, there's a reason you brought him in and he does really remind me of Cam Jordan, like from a skill set, from an ability perspective. So can he be that rundowns player is my question. You know, can he be in that rotation? Because I think Chase Young is going to be your pass rush guy. You're going to think you're going to have a little bit more specialized roles in this defense than maybe we've seen in the past. And uh, we'll see. But either way, you know, I, I'm hopeful for, for Isaiah. And I think this defensive line, it's funny because there's so many question marks on it. If you're able to tease productive seasons out of Isaiah Foskey, dare I say Peyton Turner, then suddenly this group becomes a strength. But you got to get at least one of those two players to be a part of this, especially with Tano Pasquino. I was going to say that, three. right. So, yeah, I mean, and and that kind of leads into uh, my the play of the day, in my opinion, was actually a bad play by the quarterback. And it's kind of a weird thing this time of year of like, oh, the a great play by the defense sometimes can be construed as a bad play by the offense, right? So you kind of give and take. But Derek Carr threw his first interception. Isaiah Foskey was a big part of that because he pressured him around the edge. I think he beat Trevor. Trevor is still kind of finding his way at left at right tackle. It was either Kendall Vickers or Colin Saunders on the interior that got a hand on it, batted it up in the air. Then Alante Taylor couldn't get there to make the catch. But uh, And this is just funny because they were working on tip drills in practice that day. Um, he gets downfield and is able to get a hand on it and just bats it up in the air. And uh, Demario Davis comes down with the interception. Now, if, if this was a regular season game, what would probably happen is the offensive player would come down with it because – that's the Saints luck as the other team would score a touchdown after this great play. But either way, it was it was a fun play. And I thought it was a great play by Alante Taylor, but it was also just a combination, rushing coverage, right? That's what they talk about. It's not only about the pass rush. It's not only about the defensive backs and coverage. It needs to be a combination because those two things affect each other. And that's just a good example of, okay, Isaiah would never recorded a stat on that play, but he would have impacted it in such a way that it allowed the other players to make plays on the ball. And that's what you need to see. He would say, hey, I want double-digit sacks. I just want to see a player that's impacting the game. Yeah, and you you mentioned, obviously, this guy's production, we we haven't seen anywhere close to what the Saints are hoping he's capable of. Uh, just wild that, you know, he he's the all-time leader in sacks for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. The history of the school, so that, that says a lot there, too, obviously. Yeah, and, and I think it's it's again it's yeah it's frustrating for a player who was used to being that impact guy, that dude, right? To suddenly have to start at the bottom of the totem pole again, and that's what he was doing last year. I think he has great guys to learn from. I think Cam is as good of a mentor in that room as you could hope for, especially for a player like Isaiah with the skill set like Isaiah. Um, and so yeah, if you're if you're the Saints, you're looking at it and saying, hey, Cam, look at Cam's first year. See what he did in his first year? Basically nothing. Um, so don't feel like that's the story of your career. Like you can, I mean, Cam has gone on to have a hall of fame type career after basically doing nothing as a rookie. Okay. So you need to make that jump and that year one to year two jump is important. In my opinion, if you're going to be, you know, a, you know, a very, if you're going to, if you're going to be a consistent NFL contributor, you, you want to see that jump from year one to year two. Now, it's not always the same. Like a guy like Trevor is tough because that year one basically didn't happen. So I kind of view this as almost year two for Trevor. So you want to see that Trevor Penning jump this year that we didn't see last year. You know, Caesar, I think, struggled in year two and made that jump in year three. So it's not always that. But this is a great opportunity for guys because you're not dealing with all the rookie stuff. And, and you can kind of just get there. I think we're seeing similar things from Jay Cannon right now. So... That's it. I have in terms of notes. Uh, anything else you have that you want to hit before we get out of here? No, just hoping too. We see a Saint, you know, obviously a second round pick in Foskey. We haven't seen the Saints have much luck with the defensive end prospects of late in the draft. So hopefully uh, this one can turn around and get out of his own head and just cut it loose, as DA said. That's certainly true. And yeah, we're going to talk about another second round pick in the next segment. So let's close out this one, hit the break. And we will get into that. This is Inside Black and Gold. I'm Jeff Nowak. He is Steve Geller. We're going to talk about Marcus Robinson. No, 
Marcus Robertson, Saints secondary coach. We got an interview with him, Kool Aid McKinstry, Chase Young, a couple other things. Stick around. And we're back on Inside Black and Gold. I'm Jeff Nowak. He is Steve Geller. And as promised, we're going to dive in on uh, Kool Aid McKinstry. And we're going to talk about a player who wasn't actually out there, but it does sound like. We might see him for the first time in that number 34 jersey at mandatory minicamp. I asked Dennis Allen how he feels like his rehab is going. He said it's on course. There have been no setbacks. And the hope is that he could get out there in individual drills for next week, maybe work off to the side with trainers during the team drills, that sort of thing. Kind of like we saw Jalen Ford um, yesterday, Wednesday. So that's a good sign. You know, and and I don't think his injury is one that you're super concerned with, um, but it is one that's just like you just want to kick it and get out there. And uh, and I, I'm I'm excited to see him because I think there's a lot of excitement around this player and what he could do. The frustrating thing is he wasn't able to have this time when Paulson Debo and Marshawn Lattimore weren't there to, right. to to get kind of in that mold. No, totally uh, on par with that. I, I agree that you know you you were hoping. You know, you could get some kind of work. I know it wasn't expected at all what he's dealing with right now. Uh, and I think what was it? DA basically said he'll be out there, but you're not expecting him to take part in any team kind of drills for net, for the mandatory mini camp. Yeah, and that's that's fine. Uh, the the original, you know, uh, schedule was hey, we're hoping to get him back on the field in June. That's what that's what we're talking about right now is getting him back on the field in June. Um, so either way, let's hear from Marcus Robertson. He, Talked a good bit about the, you know, secondary room in general. What do you see from the guys who are out there? Uh, and we're, we're going to cut this clip in half. This first segment is going to be that, plus some comments on Kool-Aid. So let's hit it. Obviously, three OTA sessions, you know, Depot and Lattimore were not here. So you got a good look at a lot of the depth in that room this week. What, do you, what are your thoughts come out field? Um, well, the good thing is that we're still practicing, right? <laughs> um, so, so every single day, I, I do believe we're getting better. Uh, the key thing uh, for us, right, is to uh, um, obviously uh, take in the information, right, and try to execute it as best way as possible, right? Then, then we want to go in and and clean it up, and then we want we don't really want uh, repeat offenders, and so that's some things that we that we continuously work on every single day. And when you say repeat offenders, what what does that mean? Well, well, well. The, the rule of thumb is 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 you don't want to keep making the same mistake over and over and over again. So that that shows that shows that you are learning, that you're growing in the system, things of that nature. So and sometimes it could be a technique perspective, and sometimes it could be something from above the neck that you got to clean up. So that's what we try to do out here every single day. Saw so, uh, a tip drill drill earlier today, which has seemed to work out over the course of the <laughs> so far. Can you tell us a little bit about where that came about? Uh, yeah, well, it's just a so I mean it's just a vision zone drill. And so, I, so in order for me to, to 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 try to emphasize the opportunity to have vision in a, in, a, in in that particular technique that we were playing, um, you got to see the quarterback, you got to see the ball. The game's about the ball. So, uh, in order for you to be able to catch a tip ball from the opposite side of the field, is you got to be able to see it thrown. So, if you don't see it thrown, there's no way in ATLL that you're gonna get there. So, that's the way. That's one of my ways of training the, the secondary's eyes for having vision on the quarterback. And then, um, I think this is the first time I've gotten to talk to you since the Kool Aid McKinstry draft pick. What do you feel like he adds to the cornerback room? Oh, I mean, I, I, first of all, I believe he's an exceptional uh, young player. Uh, I think he's going to give us some 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 multi flexibility in the back end with his ability to play corner and ability to move inside. Uh, 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 outstanding um, uh, high football IQ type guy, right? Um, uh, seems to be fundamentally sound, a willing tackler, and uh, you know he, he's got he got he got he got a little chip on his shoulder. So I, I, I like I'm looking forward to seeing him get out here, but I'm excited we got him. He didn't have a ton of those inside snaps when he was with Alabama. What is it about his maybe demeanor or play style that? that um, well, I think um, well it, well when you watch the tape and you cut up him as a as a tackler or enforcer off the edge, you know he's he's willing. Um, uh, kind of a no fear type of guy. Um, when you talk to him about just X's and O's, um, he can tell you what every single person in the secondary is doing. So you, when you, when he's he's got a, a wealth of knowledge from playing early uh, in the Alabama system. Is that normal um, from a second round pick at this point? Like what you'd expect to see out of him? Um, I would say he is. He is. He's. He's well above the bar for a a. Um, 
uh, defensive back coming in into the NFL as far as a uh, uh, football intelligence perspective. I mean, he, 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 he knows what all five guys are doing in the secondary, which is fantastic because sometimes, you know, all we do sometimes in the defense is we just kind of move the X's. And he's one of those X's that we feel like we'll be able to move. Of course, we got to get him on the grass to figure that out. But I can tell you right now, from an X's and O perspective, he got it. He got it. He got it, right? Nose perspective. He got it. Um, and you know, that's high praise for a guy that has not even gotten on the field yet. But that's kind of what we've heard about Kool-Aid is he's a guy that, you know, is ahead of the curve from a processing standpoint in terms of a rookie coming into the NFL. Um, part of that's playing at Alabama. Part of that is just who he is as a, as a person. He's a very intelligent young guy. And so that's that's good to hear. I, I am I'm interested to see how they deploy him, whether he ends up being in the nickel. Uh, Da said after the draft that they're going to have him work both inside and outside. I'm just interested to see how that looks. But either way, you know, this is a very talented defensive back room. You know, and I think you know year two under under Marcus, uh, you you hope that there's continues to be development. And I don't know how much we'll see of Kool Aid this year. I don't know where he'll end up in that pecking order in terms of inside outside. But uh, when you hear stuff like that from a defensive backs coach that hasn't even gotten a guy on the field yet, I think that's pretty telling. Yeah. And this DA tenure from even, you know, defensive coordinator now into head coach, that's something I haven't been worried about is the play of the secondary, the talent they've brought in definitely has the eye for it. Uh, I feel like, uh, you know, that's Dennis Allen's specialty. And, you know, so it's it should be something that's been a strength and continues to be a strength for this black and gold squad. And, yeah, that it is kind of curious to know if really everyone's healthy, everyone's still on board with this squad. Where does Kool-Aid fit in? And it, it seems logical maybe that that slots position as a as a backup to Alante. I don't I don't know, because we obviously saw. Taylor working that spot last year and you would think he would progress and be even better this season. Yeah. And I don't think you're ruling out a trade yet. Um, right. I don't think it's likely in terms of Lattimore, but I, again, I'm not ruling it out. If it was ever going to happen, it was going to be in this time frame, which is, you know, probably post mini camp pre training camp. Right. So, you know, you it's tough to project until you know, for sure that, that Marshawn is going to be here. We haven't even seen him. Right. So how can we say for sure? Like, okay. I don't know, maybe he kind of disappeared into the ether. He doesn't actually exist anymore, as far as I know. That that could be the case, because I haven't seen anyway. Well, um, I haven't, haven't seen him at practice, and obviously he's been awfully quiet on social, too. That's not a bad thing, though. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think that's that's the difference between him and like an Alvin, who we know what Alvin's doing. I know he's spent time in Africa doing a lot of stuff there, doing a lot of outreach there. He's active with NASCAR. We see him with NASCAR stuff all the time. So you kind of know... Oh, that's where Alvin is, right? <laughs> we yeah. I genuinely no clue what's been going on uh, with Marshawn because he's a very, very, you know, closed off Low individual key. in terms of his personal life. We, we just don't know a ton about him, but that's that's OK. But I do want to play the second half of that clip. Um, and part of that is Marcus talking about Marshawn and kind of the disappointment of him not being there. You know, last year, we heard a lot about takeaways or an emphasis forcing turnovers, forcing interceptions. Obviously, that worked out to some extent. You know, there was a lot of a lot of interceptions made. Going into this season, how do you kind of bridge that? Of like, yeah, we, we did that well last year, but that doesn't change. You got to do it again. Oh, yeah. Well, I talk about all the missed opportunities because I don't know how many we had, but we should have had probably 20 more. So there's opportunities that we actually left on the table. So uh, the key thing, all right, in order to be a dominant defense is to be dominant, all right, and that is to make the plays you're supposed to make, all right, when you get an opportunity. You know, I tell guys all the time, there's, there, you know, when you're in press coverage, you got you got five places to win, right? You can win at the LOS, you can win in the climb, you can win in the break point, all right, now you can win at the POA. So at each and every phase, you got opportunities opportunity to win so you might lose one of the phases but now all I need you to do is win two of the three and then be physical at the point of attack so anytime that ball's on the ground anytime it's in the air we feel like we've got an opportunity to to put our hands on it especially if we play with with good eye discipline good technique and had a uh, and and had good alignment going into it so we're alignment assignment technique finish 
So that's what we want to do and, and understand this, that, that practice makes permanent, all right? I believe that practice is everything. It's the only place you can get better, and this is the only place that uh, you got an opportunity to actually go out and make mistakes, clean it up, all right? And then when you go out on the field and you can execute at a higher level. Obviously, a whole lot of chatter this offseason about Marshawn Lattimore. DA talked about speaking with him and everything. What's your expectation for Marshawn going into 2024 at this time? Um, you know, I've only had one year with, with Lattimore. Um, obviously, he's, he's extremely talented. Obviously, I wish he was here. I do think there's some things that he can do uh, to be better, but from a uh, from an athletic perspective, he's he's extremely talented. Now, if he could put that together, or if he could put that together with some technique and um, a little bit more uh, knowledge of the game as far as how he's being attacked, um, I think he'll have he'll be exceptional. I mean, because he's 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 a phenomenal corner in this league. So you can't take that away from him. So, but I do think he is missing out on an opportunity to get better as of right now. Get time for one. DA said that um, he expects him to be at mini camp along with everyone else. Have you talked to him recently? And oh no, he'll 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 be at mini camp. I'm not I'm not. I'm, first, I mean, in my opinion, he'll be at mini camp. I'm not concerned about that. But I just wish we were we had time to work with him on just some of the little things, the the little details that make the big differences down the line. Yeah, and again, that was Marcus Robertson, the secondary coach. I always want to say Robinson. It's not Robinson. It's Robertson. Um, it. It practice makes per- perfect. He said practice makes permanent. I like that. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. No, but I think that's telling. Like, we can sit here all day long and say, hey, Marshawn should be there. Like, yeah, what, what, it's not, it's, it's, it's voluntary. He doesn't have to be there. He should be there. Or at least he should have been there for some portion of this, of this program. And it's been consistent, though, with Marshawn in the past, too. It's not like, oh, this is the first year he's not there. Right. And I think they, they knew he wasn't going to be there. It's not like it was right. a surprise. But there's there's frustration there, right? Like, you can hear sure. that in his voice. Like, he's not. I'm not making this up. We're not making this up. The coaches are frustrated that Marshawn is not there. They feel like there's work that he should be doing that they can help him with to elevate his game. And, and that's the, the thing about Marshawn is – he he could show up and and be that top corner in the NFL. They, it, it's it's a matter of of get doing the work and you know it's again it's like you can tell everyone's trying to be measured with how they talk about it <laughs> as they and for good reason. But that's kind of where you are, and this is the time of year where you kind of have to just kind of you kind of have to meter that that frustration and say, hey, he'll be here next week. Which all indications are that he'll be there for mini camp. We talked about this like. If you're not holding out for a contract, there's no reason to not be at minicamp. Like, even if you are of the belief that Marshawn wants to be traded, and I'm not saying he does, but even if you are of the belief that Marshawn wants to be traded, it wouldn't make sense to not show up. Because if you did want to be traded, you had every you would have every reason to go in there and, and make it very clear to everyone in the room that you wanted to be traded. Like, you don't do that by not being there. You get fined by not being there. You, you're going to keep your money and, and do what CJ did. Right. Uh, but either way, that's going to be a, that's going to be that relationship is going to be something to watch. Like, I don't think that there are bridges burned. I don't think anything like that, but it's going to be it's going to be something to watch and, and we'll and we'll find out. But I did think that was pretty telling of, you know, Marcus just kind of being like, yeah, we we would we want him here. Uh, <laughs> we're not we're not happy that he's not here. It's not cheap to miss the practices. First day, 17 K. The second day it goes up to 34K. And then if you're not that, that third day, 51K. So, I mean, so, so a lot of these guys that might not be a lot of money, but when that's that's a significant total right there. I'm just saying. Yeah. I mean, it's, it'd be like you getting like three speeding tickets in three days. Like it's not a ton of money, but it would also be like, damn, I don't want to pay that. Exactly. Um, so for yeah, showing I, up. Yeah, right, right. Just to, for doing your job, right? Like, so yeah, he's going to be there, and and we'll we'll be able to talk about football finally. But either way, one other guy who has not been at these practices, um, but has been in the building every day, according to Dennis Allen, is is Chase Young. And so I do want to close out this segment with an update on Chase. And uh, here's what here's what Dia had to say. Been here every day. He's in all the meetings, um, and when we're out here at practice, he's in doing the rehab uh, and the things that he's capable of doing. I see a guy that's highly motivated to have a great year, you know, and, um, you know, I think to this point, you know, he's been he's been on track in terms of the healing process. 
you know, we'll probably have another update, you know, in terms of where he's at here in, you know, a week or two. Probably will paint a little bit clearer picture as to, you know, when we think he might be back. But he's doing everything that we're asking him to do. He's highly motivated. He wants to be a part of this organization, wants to be a part of this team. And I'm excited about getting him out here when he's healthy enough to be out here. Well, yeah, he's motivated. He'll be a free agent next year. <laughs> yeah, I hope he's motivated to be on the team that he just signed with. Right. right. That'd, be, that'd be a rough take if it was like, ah, he's kind of bummed out that he's hanging out in New Orleans. It's so hot. <laughs> uh, he doesn't like seafood. No. Um <laughs> Yeah, no, but that's it's you, you don't want to hear about setbacks, right? Like this is the time of year where all you want to hear is yes, everyone's on track. We knew he wasn't going to be out there for OTAs or minicamp. That was always the plan. When they signed him, they knew he had to have the neck surgery. And the plan was to get him back at some point in training camp. Now, I'd hope that that some point is either for the start of training camp or very early in training camp. But we just don't know right now. And the good news is that he is around, right? Like that's why when you take attendance, it, it, there's always this caveat of we didn't see him. doesn't mean he's not there, right? Exactly, yeah. He does lot of he's there every day in the film room. Right. In a lot of instances, when the guys go out to the field, that's when they go and get their rehab work done because there's no meetings going on. So it's a good time for them to do that work. And then when the practices are done, all this, all the meeting work you're available for, right? So it just makes sense. That's why you're not going to see them necessarily standing out. I mean, some guys you will. But if you, you know, especially the guys who have to do significant rehab work, they're not going to be just standing out there with a, with a, you know, a, a what's it called? A bucket hat on. Bucket hat, right. Yeah. Kind of, you know, and a, and a, and a personal fan, right? Like they're, they, they're doing stuff, but it's good to hear that he's in the building. He's in all the meetings. And um, hopefully by the time we get to the actual training camp, he'll be ready to go. No, you've heard Cam excited about it. Carl Granderson talked about it too. Just you can't wait to work with a guy like Chase Young. We've talked about it too. A former second overall pick in the draft. You know the talent's there. Unfortunately, he's dealt with injuries. Uh, Gutted through some stuff apparently last year with that neck and still played instead of opting out of having that surgery. I guess when you get traded to a team like the 49ers, you're like, crap, I'm I'm in it to win it here. I got a chance at a ring. Yeah. And he's got playoff experience. He's got Super Bowl experience, right? Like he, that's uh, it's not for nothing, right? There's a lot of players on this team that uh, don't remember getting to the postseason, right? This isn't this isn't your 2017 Saints where you know you yeah you had that three year lapse where you didn't make the playoffs, but a lot of the veterans were just like yeah we remember we know uh, what it was like to get this Saints team to the postseason. You don't really have that anymore, and so yeah, uh, we'll see. But either way, let's wrap up that segment. We're going to come back, and I want to talk about the stock up players, the players who improved their standing at OTAs. Not necessarily guys who who struggled, because I think it's too early to really make determinations on that. But who has put themselves in a good position going forward? This is Inside Black and Gold. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. Follow me on Twitter at Jeff underscore Nowak. You can follow Steve at Steve Geller WWL. Follow the show at Saints underscore pod. We'll be right back. And we're back on Inside Black and Gold. I'm Jeff Nowak. He is Steve Geller. One more OTA segment and then more next week of minicamp, which we pretend is a lot different from OTAs. In reality, there's just more of it. It's the same thing. Except you got to be there. Yeah. The only difference is we can finally stop talking about players who aren't there and start talking about all the injured players who are not there. But that's fine. We'll do it. deal with it. But I wanted to get into kind of a stock up segment. And next week, I think we can get into more of like a stock up, stock down if we wanted to. But this week, I just want to talk about stock up. Some of the players who stood out to me, some of the players who I felt like went into this week and improved their standing. Now, before we get going, I will mention, just because I don't want to close the episode on a negative thing, I do want to mention a couple of players who I felt like missed those opportunities, had a chance for a stock up moment, missed them. So first, Charlie Smith. Oof. Rough day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we don't know a ton about Charlie Smith. He's got a ton of time to kind of put his best foot forward, if you will, into that kicking competition. He did not do that yesterday. Granted, it was a windy day, but that's supposed to be his thing, right? 
Isn't that the idea? Like Northern Ireland is windy. Well, a, a good Irish breeze going through practice. Yeah, it was going right to left. He was four. Okay. So there was some discrepancy of three for seven or four for seven. I'm going to give him like a 3.5 because I'm pretty sure the only reason it seemed like he made one of them was because the uprights on the practice field are like tilted to the left slightly. Uh, and he kicked it like way above. So if you kind of draw a line, it kind of like would keep like the higher you kick it, the better chance you have because the invisible line. So I, I think he missed. It was close enough that it was like, you know, whether you would count it in a game, it was a rough kick. It's going to be tough for this kid to make the team, I think, obviously, with a guy like uh, Groupie last year had his ups and downs. But I feel like, you know, the team obviously expected that to have the growing pains with both of their undrafted uh, rookie specialist there. And uh, I, I guess, you, you know, segueing into you, you could probably say the arrows going up or ha has been pretty high for Lou Headley in these OTA sessions has been booming punts. Oh yeah. We're going to get, we're going to get into that, but yeah, but Charlie, it was a rough day. That's fine. He's a, he's, you're, you're figuring out how to be an NFL kicker. Just right. was not, was not the day that like, there was a chance for us to come out of that day being like, Charlie Smith right there in the kicking competition. Mm -hmm. Instead, it kind of feels like there was, you know, Blake Rupi just a little bit, you know, like it's hard to see me, uh, me to see him unseating Blake Rupi in that competition. But either way, we'll move on. A couple others. Kyle Sheets, we talked about the drop. I thought he had a couple opportunities to really shine and, and just didn't. Not a huge opportunity, not a huge deal, but that is what it is. Nathan Peterman, we talked about that interception on his first rep of team drills. That's tough. And Kendra Miller, yeah, I'd like, I wanted to see more. Like, when we talked about Alvin not being there, Jamal wasn't there for one of the sessions. There was just really no Kendra Miller moments that I was like, oh yeah, that's that's the guy. That's he's gonna take over. Like we didn't see it. So I need to see more out of him. He's got time. But yeah, like just the in finally into the stock up players. Like I said, I didn't want to be negative and I started with negative stuff. But Lou Headley, um, Ooh. I'm happy because you know, we talked about this. I I watched him in warm-ups a lot of the season because I was on the sideline and it was just you know, that's what you're out there watching. Right. And I did feel like there were moments where it was like, he can make these kicks. Like he can, he can kick more booming punts and he's being asked to kick a certain way. And that's what he's doing. And that's true to an extent. I do think that he has spent time this off season working on his leg and adding more length on his kicks. And DA talked about that a little bit yesterday and we've seen it, you know, and we, he, he is elite in the area of the game that is directional kicking, pinning guys, not allowing returns. If he can get that length a bit more, a bit closer to league average, then you're talking about an elite punter um, who doesn't allow returns and then also is able to flip the field. So hopefully that's not a mirage. Hopefully we do see more of that in the season, especially in instances like we're not talking about when you're at the 45 and you want to kick it inside the 20. Like we know we can do that. It's when you're punting from your own 15, can you flip the field and do it in a way that sets up your defense in a good situation and not, you know, starting a drive at the opponent's 40 with no return. So I thought stock up for him for sure. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, we, for some reason it seemed that Headley's first punt in the game was never pretty. And then after that, it's, he kind of settled down. Hopefully he gets that kind of, uh, I guess, negative out of his system because uh, there were a few times during games last year, it was just ugly. Well, I think people were very hard on Lou in ways that were not hard on rookies typically because rookies struggle. That's what happens with rookies. And I think because he's older and it looked and different. And because you only see a punter so many times throughout a game, those struggles are magnified. And the same thing goes for a kicker, for Blake Rupi, right? But like any, you know, if if this was uh, like if this was At Perry, right? And he and he drops a pass, you'd be like, okay, yeah, he's a rookie, he's finding his way. You 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 you're expecting him to improve over time and may, fix those mistakes. For some reason, with a kicker, it's like cut him immediately. Punter, it's like cut him immediately. So it's like, yeah, you should expect him to get better year over year. There, there, there should have been an expectation that, yeah, he's he's going to have moments that aren't perfect. Um, but the reason I think this, the other reason that you lost that grace is because you didn't you didn't have to go with the rookies. You chose to go with the rookies, so they put a little undue pressure on them because it's like we could have had Will Lutz, he was here. We, we let him go. We could have had Blake Gillikin, he was here. We let him go, and so now we're not perfect. And we chose to be that way. So I think that's part of it. But 
I, I, I think that his struggles were overplayed at points because people focus way too much on hang time and gross pun yeah. average and yeah, gross pun average and didn't take the time to kind of imp- look at, okay, how did his punts affect the game? And in a lot of instances, it was good. So uh, I'm glad to see people, you know, he's putting his best foot forward. Uh, we can use that again, but we'll see. Moving on. Uh, the next guy who I think is stock up after these three OTA sessions, we didn't talk about him a ton today, but we have talked about him a ton as Jay Kaner. I just think going into these OTA sessions, all the talk was about Spencer Rattler. It was like Jake maybe be in that quarterback, backup quarterback competition, but we're not sure. I think now you're looking at it and be like, yeah, 100%. He is the clubhouse leader for that job. And, you know, obviously we're going to go to training camp and that's, you know, that would be the, that's a much bigger hill to climb than what we've seen thus far. But it's hard to look at Jake and not see his stock up, that needle up from where it was a month ago. Yeah, and uh, definitely curious. You mentioned training camp. Those joint sessions with the 49ers, basically for everybody, though, are going to be so crucial because uh, going back with Jake, though, we, we saw him struggle in the preseason games. And then after that, the poor guy got no work all, all year long because, you know, Derek Carr's the guy. And he was suspended. That didn't help. Um, yeah, that didn't help either. Yeah, well, I thought he played well in the first two preseason games. He did love that lead that game-winning drive in the game against the Chiefs that ended with that kind of crazy fumble or uh, blocked – uh, interception, Kyle Phillips, I think it was. They got it anyway. Uh, but it was that final preseason game. The last time we saw him on the field, which is that's the lasting memory, is all those interceptions because he was just spamming the Lucas Crow button. Like if Lucas Crow was the X on the on yes. the controller, just, X X X pump fake X, uh, and uh, you know the other team figured that out and they started intercepting it anyway. Uh, but either way, happy happy about what he, we've seen from him. Next guy. And this is in part because there's now ample opportunity on the defensive line, particularly for a guy who can be kind of a combo inside outside rusher. And uh, it's trading Jeff Coat. You know, when we talked earlier, he wasn't really high on my list of UDFAs with a chance to make the roster because you felt like, hey, there's a pecking order and this is, and Tano's on it. Now, Tano Passigno is certainly not going to be ready for the start of the regular season. And so that's going to open up a, a spot for maybe a veteran, maybe a maybe a young guy. And I thought I think Trajan kind of has that build. He's a big dude who can have some of that inside outside potential. I think it's probably more likely he lands on the practice squad. But we've seen him make some impact plays. I know Bobby was really high on him after yesterday's practice, and uh, so we'll see. I think he's a guy that as we get closer and closer to training camp, and especially once we put pads on, uh, I'm excited to see how he can kind of make his presence felt. But I just feel like he fits what this team wants to do. And so, you know, in part because of Tano, but also in part because of what he's done, I think his stock is up. SEC guy too. So it'll be interesting to see, obviously, Missouri and Arkansas, he spent time at. uh, And we know, obviously, the level of talent that he's been going up against has always been NFL quality. No doubt. No doubt. A couple of the guys we've talked a good bit about, um, Nick Saldaveri. You know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, oh, he's been blowing people away at guard. But he's been holding up. And, you know, the fact that he's getting these reps at all means that his needle is in the right direction. His stock is up because if the team didn't believe that he could hold up at that position, they wouldn't have him out there. So I think that he there's a chance that he ends up kind of taking a back seat as we get further in camp because you just want to go with a more veteran option next to next to Taliesin Fuanga. But for now, it's hard not to see his stock up. Um, one other guy that we talked about a lot, Jordan Mims, been making a lot of plays. I don't think anyone was really talking about him at all going into rookie minicamp, right? Yeah. So the fact that he is kind of a name on people's radar now is – that's what we're talking about here. It's guys who – you kind of went into this part of the program uh, with just like, who knows? You know, uh, there's a lot of names and we'll see. I think he's a guy that certainly has put himself in a position where you're competing – Right. Like, I think he's definitely a guy that worst case scenario, you'd want to keep on the practice squad. And uh, I think he's going to be like, again, I, like I've talked about this, like I think Jamal Williams spot is not guaranteed this year and there's going to be a competition. And I think he's going to be in it. No. And just when you see things going on in these voluntary workouts where, you know, Mims is running with the ones and that that, that to me says a lot, obviously. Um, well, it says so Alvin's they, not here. Yeah. So. Alvin's not here, but you would think, 
a Jamal or even a Kendra would be in that spot, but no, it was, it's Jordan. Well, Kendra has gotten a good, a good number of first team reps. So I wouldn't say, uh, but you know, it, it's, it's an example of this was an opportunity for Kendra to take advantage of Alvin, not being here and get involved in more of these sets. I will say that they've been using Taysom a lot more in running back sets. So that's limited. Some of the action, right. For some of these guys. Um, but the way that in the same idea that Kendra maybe didn't take advantage of that, I thought Jordan did. So that's kind of where I'm looking at it. One more stock up player. And if I'm not naming a player, it doesn't necessarily mean their stock is down. That just means kind of they've, they've been static and that's not a bad thing. A lot of players, it's like Derek Carr's stock is not up or down. He's just where you want him to be. Right. The final player. And this is really more about, we don't re- we didn't really know. Um, how this pecking order was going to shape out, but now we we do because Marshawn and Adiba were not there the last two weeks. Uh, Rajon Wright, he's been getting the first team reps across from, you know, whether Alante's outside or in the slot, he's been getting the first team cornerback reps. So that's just a sign that this team feels, you know, pretty confident in his abilities. He didn't he didn't lose that spot, right? Like pretty much every day in the first team reps where they didn't have Adibo and Taylor, it was Rajon Wright. Um, if Things weren't going well in week two. They would have adjusted that. They didn't. So that's a good sign that he's he's putting his his best foot forward. And if it sounds vague, it's because I've only seen we've only seen two three practices. So it's not like I can tell you what he's been doing in the other days of practice. But clearly, it's been good enough to keep him in that spot. So Rajon Wright is another player that wasn't really on my radar going into OTAs, but is now kind of on that list of okay, he's a fringe roster candidate. Yeah, guy that was uh, practice squad for Panthers and Raiders a year ago and trying to make a mark now in New Orleans. And like you mentioned, obviously, no Lattimore, no Adebo, but yet you just got to make a, most of those opportunities you're given, and that that's what he's been doing at least. All right. Uh, anyone else that you want to you wanna throw on that list? Uh, I'm trying to think uh, off the top of my head. Uh, nothing standing out too much to me right now uh, on either side of the ball. It's so tough, obviously – to gauge anything with the trenches right now. I, I, but I will say, uh, I thought Brian Brzee has looked pretty good. Uh, anxious to see more of him, obviously, when pads come on. But I think he's a guy in entering year two that uh, things are coming together for him, and I think he's going to be more disruptive than a lot of people are expecting. Yeah, it's just an example of, like, my stock on him was already high, so it's tough for him to, you know. Get higher. <laughs> yeah, how much higher can it get? Um, one other guy that I, that I should have mentioned that I didn't, uh, tight end Michael Jacobson. Just, again, not a guy yeah. that you really thought a ton about. Another, he's in the same kind of grouping as Jordan Mims in that he spent a lot of time last year on the practice squad, so he's familiar with with the the situation, the organization, the the building, that sort of thing. He's been very involved. And it's not because there's uh, the starter missing, right? Like it's not because Alvin's not here. So Jordan is getting more run or uh, Marshawn and Debo aren't here. So Rajon's getting more run. Jawan and Foster are here. He's just been involved, right? Like he's just been a guy who is finding himself open, making plays on the ball. And uh, so he's a guy that forces you to say his name. And, and that's what's happening in a lot of these instances. When I say stock up, it's like, they are forcing me to say their name more than I probably thought I would be this time a month ago. And so that's where we are. But all right, that's all I got. Anything else you want to throw in before we clear out of this, this uh, popsicle stand and get ready for the mini camp that will be so, so different? I was going to say no more voluntary podcasts. They're mandatory from here on out. God damn it. <laughs> so I should have been skipping these is what you're telling Yeah, me. you could have just let the dog do it. Yeah, right. The dog, the dog is sitting here pretty annoyed that we haven't gone on a walk in a while. So um, I'm gonna get gonna do that. I'm gonna do that. And then I'm gonna go watch the Celtics. Finally. I've only been waiting a week. Do you see the Lakers are trying to poach my man Danny Hurley? I figured you'd be pretty ticked about that. Those sons of bees. I hope he I hope he has seen the cautionary tale that is like Billy Donovan and Rick Patino and is like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Give What's me a three. You think, you think Porzingis goes tonight? Yeah, he's going to play. I don't know how much he's going to play, but he's going to play. Yeah, so we'll get to see it. The real question is, how mean are Celtics fans going to be to Kyrie Irving? I oh, think brutal. Be, I think they're going to be mean. That's Absolutely. What, that's honestly what I'm looking forward to, just how mean they are. Because Celtics fans are rough. No, I, I, like, I love the soap opera going on. Kyrie returning to Boston, and then you're going to have Porzingis going back to Dallas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, a, it's a fun matchup. Like They yeah. lucked out with this matchup, in my opinion. 
Uh, and so, yeah, I'm looking forward. It's going to be a fun couple weeks. But all right, this isn't a Celtics podcast. <laughs> this is a Saints podcast. And we talked for like an hour about the Saints. So you can't be too mad about it. Anyway, who that goes Saints. Be easy, y'all. Thanks for being here. Subscribe. See you soon. Peace.